Hello and welcome. Every time the Vatican releases a document, they seem to manage to increase chaos and ambiguity and heterodoxy. And this is consistent with Pope Francis once saying that he wanted young Catholics, for example, at a, an international youth conference in 2013 to make a mess. Well, that may have been a cool get down with the youth papal epithet, but in fact this seems to have spoken to only one particular kind of youth culture, the youth culture that 80-year-old men were familiar with as they were growing up. This was an anti-authoritarian, hedonistic, anarchistic, self-referential culture born in the 60s and 70s that has done so much to destroy the coherence, respect and integration of Western culture. You might get the feeling that some of these elderly men who are at the top of the church at the moment were suffering from a degree of arrested psychological development, stuck themselves in a permanent would-be adolescence all of their own. But if you ask psychological questions about the situation, you'll get psychological answers. However, what happens if we ask pneumatic, metaphysical or spiritual questions about what this generation of liberal, progressive Catholic leaders are doing? What does it mean when the beauty of order, carefully nurtured and responsible authority, intellectual and emotional coherence, and an integration with a long and deep past that has produced holiness and miracles. What does it mean when these people attack these values and break them? Where does that come from spiritually? Because that's what the authorities in charge of the senior offices of Christ's church, the church Christ founded, are doing at the moment. Personally, I find it most helpful and easiest to refer to the spirit of Judas being abroad. Our most beloved Lord Jesus chose Judas, who was to betray him as one of the twelve. But God used that betrayal to instigate both the death on the cross of our sacrificial Messiah, our Lamb, and his resurrection from the dead. In other words, God takes treachery and by some extraordinary, miraculous alchemy of his own produces good. Even from that, God takes all things and uses good, uses them for good. But at the same time, we need to defend the church by offering the right kind of rigorous analysis when the agents of disorder and sub-Christian values begin to attack and undermine the foundations of the body of Christ. And the latest document from Rome, Dignitas Infinita, does that yet again once more, as all Pope Francis's interventions have. In this case, as we look at what's been smuggled into the document, we might make use of the true magisterium, which we could, for example, call wisdom from beyond the grave. For example, to play down free will and original sin is a very dangerous business, which is what the document does. Dignitas Infinita on human dignity and gender identity issues uh, produces a mixed bag. Not everything in the document is flawed Catholic teaching. There are, in fact, some perfectly acceptable and truthful elements, truthful element in it. But having said that, we know that very often the very the best way of setting up a light that people want people to believe is to wrap it up with a degree of truth to confuse the reader, and that's what's done here. So we can acknowledge it's been rightly praised as holding the line on the traditional deposit of faith against the latest eruption of politicized gender dysphoria, which has become something like a group psychosis sweeping through our Western society and culture. It upholds traditional Christian gender values. Nonetheless, critics claim it distorts Catholic teaching by a mixture of theological insinuation, changing the hierarchical order of theological dogmas. Some of the background thinking to the document emerged when the prefect of the dicastery for the doctrine of the faith, Cardinal Victor Manuel Fernandez, known as Tucho to his friends, mused at the press conference launching it that one of the, one of the reasons why freedom of will and original sin had been downplayed in the document was that the Pope still liked to ponder on the question of whether, perhaps, hell might be empty, a concept he likes. But that requires a diminishment of the implications of the gift of free will 
and the impact of original sin. And those are indeed principles and documents advocates this diminishment. But a Christianity without a last judgment, without moral accountability at the end of time, without the philosophical implications of free will as a gift, and engaging a more homeopathic approach to original sin, is a complete departure from the faith of our forefathers. We are faced then with two difficulties. First, the theological rearrangements in the documents themselves, downplaying free will and original sin. And secondly, given the disinclination of the Pope and the Vatican to welcome external theological critique, who's going to say this in public? I remember when one of Britain's foremost and most deeply respected Dominicans, Father Aidan Nichols, signed a letter in 2019 asking the Vatican to engage in an, in an earlier theological rethink. He found himself almost instantaneously cancelled and made homeless, by the way. Most recently, Bishop Joseph Strickland, a well-known advocate of timeless Catholicism, was removed from his diocese for an as yet unexplained administrative lacunae. Well, taking part with my Catholic unscripted YouTube team, Catherine Bennett and Mark Lambert, in a modest speaking tour in Chicago recently, where I am now, I found myself reacquainted with two American Episcopal bishop voices, Catholic bishop voices, both now silent, that seem to speak presciently of the issues of our time. The first was Cardinal Francis George, who died in 2015, a former Archbishop of Chicago, wonderful man. He warned a group of his clergy what he foresaw if the church gave way to an increasingly aggressive secularism. Listen to this. I expect to die in my bed. My successor will die in prison. His successor will die a martyr in the public square. But his successor will pick up the shards of a ruined society and slowly help rebuild civilization, as the church has so often done in human history. The context of his warning was his awareness that Catholics were increasingly being oppressed by bad laws imposed by wayward governments. He went on, analogies can easily be multiplied if one wants to, to push a thesis. But the point is that the greatest threat to world peace and international justice and the church is the nation state gone bad, claiming an absolute power, deciding questions and making laws beyond its competence and we've experienced exactly that recently stating biological truths about a person's gender now comes with a threat of seven years imprisonment in scotland police officers in great britain have arrested catholics for praying silently on the king's highway for the first time in history if the voice of cardinal george articulated the danger accompanied by the belief it's the church that retains the greatest potential to rebuild sane society. Then the prophetic voice of Archbishop Fulton Sheen, who died in 1979, suggests a solution to our present ecclesial paralysis. He said, who's going to save our church? Not our bishops, not our priests and religious. It's up to you, the people. You have the minds, the eyes and the ears to save the church. Your mission is to see that your priests act like priests, your bishops act like bishops and your religious act like religious he might have said your pope acts like a pope sheen is not particularly big in the uk but he still has enormous impact in the united states with two doc doctorates and wanted as a philosophy lecturer both by oxford and columbia he in fact became a forthright catholic televangelist his weekly show life is worth living drew over 30 million viewers most of them non-catholics providing us with the means to reaccess dignitas infinita. Sheen summed up the dangers inherent in the temptation that Pope Francis has pursued to downplay sin and promote our innate dignity very well. He said, the better we become, the less conscious we are of our goodness. If anyone admits to being a saint, well, then he's in fact close to being a devil. Jean-Jacques Rousseau believed that of all men, he was the most perfect, but actually... He had so many cracks in his soul that he abandoned his children after their birth. The more saintly we become, the less conscious we are of being holy. A child is cute as long as he doesn't know he's cute. As soon as he thinks he is, he turns into a brat. True goodness is unconscious. To both these bishops, the marks of original sin 
don't appear to have been ameliorated by universal infinite dignity of the new Francis Magisterium. But being dead, they can't be cancelled by the powers that be. And we lay people, we cancel, we can't be cancelled for writing about them, talking about them and critiquing them. So let's tell the truth and help our good bishops, our good priests and our good religious who might otherwise be cancelled because they can't cancel us. <laughs>